why would I, believing that no serious moral change can come via secular politics, why would I care about what Saul Alinsky has written in his book, Rules for Radicals, a 1971 book by this community organizer? Maybe because so many Christians today are umbilically attached to their smartphones and are drenched in a constant uh, wave of politicalization coming in through the smartphones. Maybe that would make it more important. As William T. Kavanaugh has shown in his book, The Myth of Religious Violence, the Marxist and secular movements now rising up teach basically they are religious. They don't have a God, but they put the state or the collectivity in the place where God is in some other religions. They replace belief in a personal deity with a kind of belief in the state or in the collectivity. And Saul's, Saul Alinsky's Rules for Radicals has been, they say, very, uh, very influential. So what's in this book and what might we say in reaction to it? First of all, Alinsky is a relativist. On, uh, he says here, all values and factors are relative, fluid, and changing. Everything. At the same time, he believes that all people are good. Here's what he says here. If people have the power to act in the long run, they will most of the time reach the right decisions. And you see this elsewhere in the book. It's basically this continuous belief the left has that all people are basically good. All people want a chance to strive for some sort of order. It's also true that Alinsky says that people tend to like things as they are. They don't really want to change. Consequently, most of his program has to do with changing people's perceptions. Uh, we have this on page uh, 19 in the Roman numerals. Any revolutionary change must be preceded by a passive, affirmative, non-challenging attitude toward change among the mass of our people. They must feel so frustrated, so defeated, so lost, so futureless in the prevailing system that they are willing to let go of the past and chance the future. This acceptance is the reformation essential to any revolution. And on page 22, Roman numerals, a reformation means that masses of our people have reached the point of disillusionment with past ways and values. So he needs to push people into this terrible disillusionment. So that is that people are basically good, but they have to be pushed and squeezed over to the situation of disillusionment. So here on page 116, 17, 118, what, what the community organizer should do, he should seek out, search out controversy and issues rather than avoid them. An organizer must stir up dissatisfaction and discontent. He must provide a channel into which the people can angrily pour their frustrations. He must create me a mechanism that can drain off the underlying guilt of having accepted the previous situation for so long a time. Out of this mechanism, a new community organization arises. He begins his troublemaking by stirring up these angers, frustrations, and resentments and highlighting specific issues or grievances that heighten controversy. The organizers, page 119, the organizer's first job is to create the issues or problems. And on it goes here. This is to make trouble. So his business is to create friction and it's to heighten, heighten conflict any way he can. And Linsky points out on page 10 of his book, a Marxist begins with his prime truth that all evils are caused by the exploitation of the proletariat by the capitalists. From this, he logically proceeds to the revolution to end capitalism, then into the third stage of reorganization into a new social order or the dictatorship of the proletariat. And finally, the last stage is the political paradise of communism. On page three of this book, he declares, in this book, we are concerned with how to create mass organizations to seize power. That's what the book's about. Seizing power. There's not much to like about Alinsky, but, but he does kind of lay his goals out and tell you what he wants to do. I guess that's one thing. He's at war with the way uh, things are, and his plan is to bring down the current thing and raise up his wonderful communist solution. Now, as Christians, we, we also disagree with the world the way it is. We believe that his plan is to grant us free will forever while eliminating evil forever. And he wants to bring into being a moral universe of unselfishness and goodness. Jesus made clear that his kingdom was, quote, not of this world, John 18, 36. The Christian mostly keeps aloof of the strife of state versus state and focuses on embracing heaven's principles for living and for embracing this unselfish kingdom internally. And then it will flow out into the world. If God and his Christians takes the high road, Alinsky takes the low. How low? Well, let's look at a few, a few more samples from the book. Alinsky, like all Marxists, is 
anti-individualist and pro-collectivist. In fact, on page 25, he says, In action, one does not always enjoy the luxury of a decision that is consistent both with one's individual conscience and the good of mankind. The choice must always be for the latter. And so Alinsky says on page 25, In action, one does not always enjoy the luxury of a, of a decision that is consistent both with one's individual conscience and the good of mankind. And he says, Action is for mass salvation and not for the individual's personal salvation. So again, we have the collectivity looming large and the individual is, is practically not, not even there. The individual is a bad thing. In civilization, as, as you and I know it, the individual has rights of conscience, uh, responsibility, and duty. He has freedom to think and to do. Everything is calibrated on these premises. Alinsky's view diminishes the individual and replaces all these individual pieces with the collectivity, the collective. The good of the collective is of higher value than the individual conscience of an individual person. But what role could individual conscience have when the world is boiled down to this socially constructed hodgepodge of competing power relations as articulated by Karl Marx and Antonio Gramsci? In a godless world, what is conscience? What is salvation? Then you have just a world where we are trapped alone with ourselves. There is nothing transcendent, no God to worship, nothing higher, no higher moral purpose toward which to aspire, uh, no personal deity, no divine being to copy, to emulate, to strive toward that ideal. There's nothing like that. Just a bunch of dirty humans. We should also keep in mind that the collective will doesn't really exist. There really is no such thing as a collectivity, a will that belongs to the whole mob, the whole group. It has no conscience-processed unitary will. What there is is the will or purpose of the tiny cadre of, of people who are the leaders of the mob, who tell it what it thinks. In a mob, the God-given conscience that each individual has is, is overpowered by the, the will that's imposed on the collectivity by the mob leaders. That becomes what the group is thinking. Mass salvation is whatever the leaders of the group declare it to be. Whatever they say they need, that's what, that's what it is. That's what the mass salvation is. And this is anticipated to be an improvement over governments that highlight individual rights and freedoms? Yes. Where you have governments with checks and balances that prevent state power from smashing the individual, this will be an improvement over that? as imperfectly, and boy is it imperfect, but as imperfectly as Republican democracy works itself out in real life, it's infinitely superior to uh, having a mob, a party rule. You have to do everything the party says just the way it says or else you're canceled. And by the way, in communism, being canceled usually means being taken out behind the building and shot. It's a much better plan than being ruled by a party that has uh, at the core of it a group of atheists who think we're just a little bit smarter than some of the, we're animals that are just a little bit smarter than some of the other animals. Animals are kind of disposable. On page 36, there's another statement here. You do what you can with what you have and clothe it with moral garments. That's, that's how he sees it. This is an admission that moral statements made on behalf of the group are, are really just window dressing. They're just fakery. They're just there. They're just a big lie with a purpose. They're presented with the idea, the hope, of disarming the population that they're trying to, to destabilize and bring across into their revolutionary plan. And, you know, most people are very busy with the mundanities of life. They're just so busy going through that they don't want to stop and think that there's a group of people here who are busy drilling holes in everything they can drill holes into and trying to undermine the very basis of their, uh, the positive pieces of the life they do have. Now, on page 78 of his book, Alinsky also says that uh, before men can act, an issue has to be polarized. In other words, back, we're back to the idea that the community organizer needs to raise up that issue. He needs to amplify it and build it up and create it into a giant issue in everybody's minds. Remember what we said from page 10. All the goal of all this is to bring about the political paradise of communism. We have no basis, no reason to think there, that will ever be that way. And, you know, we err in passing by Alinsky's relativism too quickly. Everything he says is relative. And that is a very big piece of, of the totality of, of what's going on here. There really is no ultimate thing to which anybody can aspire. There really are no absolutes. There, there is no individual conscience. All there is is what the group says. All that is is the collective group moving toward this wonderful 
shimmering rainbow with the revolution and all the paradise of communism on the other side. And what might we say then to, to all this? Well, Rules for Radicals is, uh, is, is not so much a book on ideology as it's a book on techniques. It's a book on tactics. How best to lie to achieve your goal, to, make the, to get where you're trying to go. How to highlight grievances, real or imagined. It's a guidebook on how to enlist people to overthrow the present system and move everything toward this wonderful revolution. Marxism is a religion. It's just a religion without God. It's a dismal set of ideas having cost the lives of countless millions. And there's a lot of people today, maybe even your next door neighbor, that want to try it all over again. Its attempted implementations always end in the murder of Christians or other persons who won't go along with the group thing, or that just stand in the way of the people's utopia. Near the end of his book, Alinsky writes on page 184 and 186 uh, about the middle class. Remember, this is the context of this is 1971 when this book was written. Here's what he says. Large parts of the middle class, the silent majority, must be activated. And on page 186, all this and more must be grasped and used to radicalize parts of the middle class. So that was the goal back in 1971. We've got to radicalize uh, as much, a certain group in the middle class. Now, looking out at the closing uh, days of 2020 here, what do we see? We see groups uh, rioting in Portland, Seattle, Atlanta, Chicago, many other cities. We see them uh, despoiling, burning, uh, doing violence. And the violence in is not incidental. The violence is very intentional. It's part of this uh, whole plan to bring disillusionment and a feeling that the current arrangement hasn't worked. Now, Alinsky was about uh, enlisting, infiltrating uh, the middle class and bringing them onto line to uh, work out his, his communist paradise. But this more violent elements that we're seeing today, those are things that fit actually in the communist plan further down the road. That's quite interesting because now we're uh, several decades past the 1970s. And what do we see? Quite more additional violence. And so today in the West, there are many people, many persons who have become totally disillusioned and they've turned from the values of individual conscience to we want it now, we're going to get it, we're going to get it by burning, killing, and looting. But we do want to keep in mind that at the point of actual revolution, this mob is going to have to, uh, is going to, have to go along with what the, uh, what the leaders of their group say. Because uh, he quotes Lenin quite approvingly. Here's what he says, page 37. They have the guns and therefore we are for peace and for reformation through the ballot. When we have the guns, then it will be through the bullet. And uh, so what you have today is when this is all over, when these people are used up, because people are very disposable in a communist movement. Uh, these people will, just as the French Revolution, the leaders of the revolution wound up going to the guillotine, many of them, uh, these people too will be faced with compliance or destruction, immediate compliance or destruction. And it'll be a lot, very different world from what they're used to today. The thought of Marx and his admirers has become quite prominent today in the West, and especially in the universities and educational systems. And what you have here is a, a growing, a rising uh, interest in this, in this business. The Christian schools and universities have, have not been spared either. In fact, it's through the smartphone again and through the internet. Uh, there's all kinds of material pushing in this direction out there today. The latest iterations of Marxistic thought are as in the moment you're reading this or watching this, uh, being transmitted via smartphones, computer screens, big digital TV screens into the in the cold blue light of our bedrooms and evening. The world rushes bite by bite into the space between our ears, until our our perception begins to change, begins to go awry. We fall into the present and begin to see that the way forward involves our discarding our own individual blindness. We begin to think that Christianity is just another case of hegemonic injustice toward others. And that what matters are the cries that we have become strangely convinced are the cries of those whom we are oppressing. 
Alinsky would be tickled red. Wake up, Christians and non-Christians. You're being played.